edition of the Angels and Destiny show. Why is this show called this, you may ask? So I'll tell you, the accepted meaning of angel is messenger and the accepted meaning of destiny is to make firm establish. So my guests know bring you messages to establish what you need to know in the present. And of course, I like working with angels, the calmness they bring. Now, in a moment, I'll introduce you to my get to my wonderful guest, Meryl Kamara. But before that, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching the show live at a later date, as it means a lot to both of us to connect with like-minded people. Now, if you've never met me before, then my name is Ray, and I'm a guide who helps you remember your divine presence so that you can heal your past, create your future, and transform your present to expand your consciousness understand your spiritual path, get clarity on your next steps and take charge of your destiny so that you can fulfill your life in this perf in this lifetime, your life purpose in this lifetime. Now, each episode of this show covers various themes of your journey, a mini guide meditation and or angel oracle card with the wisdom of my wonderful guest, like today's guest, Meryl Kimara, about journeys um, in trauma healing. Now, Meryl's personal journey of healing um is been using parts work and the sudden unexpected and incredible journeys somatic parts work can take you on mariel is a trauma survivor somatic trauma therapist and recovering social worker we'll find out more about that in a bit she supports people who have a pattern of finding themselves in painful destructive abusive or addictive relationships to transform the multifaceted, multifaceted traumas at the root of their problems, so they can finally claim the safe and soulful relationships that they deserve. So without further delay, hello, Mariel, and welcome to Angel's Destiny Show. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Wonderful. So before we get into this fascinating conversation, I want to remind you that not only can you share this video, but you can also ask questions, leave comments and thoughts, as both Mariel and I want to be part of this conversation. So please don't be shy. So Mariel, why don't you tell us more about your journey and about what unexpected journeys happen in trauma healing? Yeah, gladly. So um I give a very brief history of what my life was like um, before the healing journey kind of fully took off, really. And um, I experienced quite a few bouts of depression, of anxiety, like a crippling sense of loneliness. Like anxiety, I never really used to understand why people called it anxiety, because as far as I was concerned, it was just abject terror <laughs> that I was experiencing. There was profound shame. My marriage was in a mess. All my other relationships were not much better. And I tried various different things to, to try and heal this. You know, I tried CBT and medication and counseling and changing jobs and changing partners, even changing continents, which it turns out doesn't actually work because you take oh. yourself with you. So uh, sadly, that didn't really help. Um, and then one day I was I was talking with my then boyfriend and he mentioned for about the millionth time some little nugget of recovery wisdom uh, from his 12 step journey. And suddenly it hit me and I realized that, oh, this this recovery thing is for me, too. And um, I was terrified, actually. I knew that it was time. I was about to go to my first meeting and things were going to change. And I didn't really know what life had in store for me. And maybe if I'd known, I'd have been more terrified. Yeah. But, um, Anyway, so along I went to my first meeting, fortunately with a friend kind of supporting me there. And I sat around the table thinking, ah, this, this isn't for me. This is this, this, I, I'm not one of these people. And then I remember talking to my friend afterwards. And whilst we were talking, I just suddenly had this image of this inner child within me, just kind of like holding out her hands in this sort of beseeching manner. And I just, was so aware that she was just desperately looking for love and, and, and affection in all the wrong places and from people who were incapable or unwilling to give it. And, um, and so until that point, I'd only ever scoffed at people who talked about inner child work, because as far as I was concerned, that was sentimental nonsense. Um, but then there she was, clear as day. You know, this, this was real. All of a sudden it was happening to me. And uh, I cried all the way home. It's like a 20 minute drive or so. And I woke up the next morning feeling like I'd been hit by a bus. 
And and the trauma symptoms did not let up. You know, I, I didn't actually know what it was at that point. Um, it it felt like um, it felt like my body was a car that had been hijacked by a lunatic who was just driving along, like with foot flat to the gas and then foot on the screeching on the brakes, and then sometimes trying to drive along with both of them at the same time, like the gas and the brakes, and that's the absolute worst. It's horrible. Um, and so we kind of careened along the metaphorical highway for a while until the metaphorical car kind of slid into a slight siding, crashed up against the barrier and just sort of sat there quietly smoking. <laughs> and I, I was I was relieved because it felt like the sort of the madness has, had subsided. But I was a very long way from home. And I was really confused about what had happened because... You know, I was questioning myself, even though I, you know, would worked in mental health. I was a social worker at the time, had some understanding of mental health. And I was going, well, is this, is this bipolar? Like, is this, if I've got a personality disorder, like what's going on with me? Um, and eventually I realized that actually it was something uh, far more common. It was complex PTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that's what was like having the lunatic at the wheels and then chronic fatigue was what happened once the car crashed into the sidings and just couldn't get started again. Um, and I was kind of baffled by this because I thought, well, I haven't, I haven't really experienced much trauma. You know, why, why is this happening to me? And it took quite a lot of digging for me to understand that actually a lot of my traumas were ancestral ones. They're ones that I'd inherited from many different people in my family. And for some reason, the universe had it that this would, well, I would at least try and make it stop with me. I don't know. You know, maybe it won't all stop with me, but we'll see. <laughs> it will do. I hope so. <laughs> um, and then there was a lot of vicarious trauma that I picked up from the other people around me that I was trying to support um, whilst working as a social worker and working. I used to work as an independent domestic violence advisor as well. So working with people who are at high risk due to domestic abuse. So that was all that was that was really hard work. And it was working within a very toxic system that was not it's not actually set up to really support people to heal. Um, and that's that's a whole other rant <laughs> <laughs> that, that I won't get too into. But nevertheless, social work and I had to part ways at this point. Um, and um, so my. My healing journey or, you know, this this was then this kind of catapulted me into this kind of dark night of the soul where these symptoms would not let up until I had thoroughly transformed my relationship with myself and my body and my inner children and my higher power and work and everyone in my life. Like, everything had to change. Um, and so... I have tried everything. You know, I tried I tried so many different things. I went down a good few dead ends. I spent an awful lot of money that I don't like to think about. Um, and eventually discovered the world of um, somatic trauma therapy and parts work. So when I talk about parts work, it's kind of like an umbrella term. A lot of people might be familiar with internal family systems. Um, which is kind of like the the poster boy, really, for parts work in general. But there are quite a few other modalities that kind of tweak it a little bit and work in a slightly different way. Um, and some people might just call it inner child work. Um, so I combined that with the 12-step recovery that I was doing. And it was, you know, that then things really started to shift and change. And... I don't think I was expected. Uh, I, I don't think I had expected what was about to come because it, it got pretty psychedelic <laughs> without <laughs> taking any substances of any kind. I found that for me, it's just completely unnecessary. I can travel through the realms without that. And um, it's interesting because the, the guy who created IFS, Internal Family Systems, this guy called Dick Schwartz, and um, he's this very kind of 
it, it comes across as very sensible and contained and rational and but yet he he brings in these concepts into internal family systems that hitherto had only been seen as the realm of kind of shamanism or kind of very alternative healing so he kind of somewhat uncomfortably at times straddles the world worlds of psychiatry and mysticism and so he has the kind of the more commonly understood parts of the system would be the the exiles which are like the wounded child parts the, the parts that carry those original wounds and all the pain that's connected to them and then we often have a whole system of protectors which are the parts that come in to try and stop us from ever having to feel the pain of the exile ever again in many and very different ways. So that could be people pleasing, addiction, uh, any kind of addiction, not just substances, sex, love, gambling, work, whatever. Um, and like a million other different ways in which our systems really intelligently try to protect us. So those are kind of your conventional ones. And then it gets slightly weirder with um, what he calls legacy burdens. It's still relatively conventional. So legacy burdens are the ancestral traumas or the collective traumas. So those are the ones that we pick up from being around other people. Um, and we pick them up in, in a number of different ways, some of which we understand and some of which we don't. Um, and again, that probably be a whole other talk on how that works. Um, and then there's what he calls unattached burdens or entities, which are parts that come in that don't actually seem to have anything to do with the system. They're not from your childhood. They're not from your ancestral line. They're not from the culture around you. They're just some kind of entity, often malign, that has just come in and is just hitching a ride in your system. And this is where it gets a bit like, like shamanism. And, and you can essentially, in IFS, you can kind of exorcise them simply by saying, I'm not scared of you, it's time for you to go. And if you really mean that, they will. Um, so that that's quite interesting. And then there's this... Um, kind of a part that seems particularly relevant to me, which is about working with spirit guides. And um, this is not something that Dick Schwartz particularly talks about. A couple of colleagues of mine kind of collared him at a, a conference a short while ago, and they said to him, Dick, why is it that, you know, if, uh, is, is this a thing, right? So the thing that happens is that we start practicing, we start doing IFS, and then our clients come to us having our experiences. And so we're essentially treating ourselves through the client, or they're bringing messages to us that are of significant or importance to us. And like, what, what's going on here? And he just sort of said, looked up at the sky and said kind of quietly, some, I don't know the exact words, yeah. but something along the lines of that, I think there's something else out there. There's something that supports us. And um, yeah, so I kind of, I talk about those just because what I found in my journey was quite a few of those kind of more unusual types of parts if you like like coming up and actually one of one of the first significant ones that I came across was um was an archetype actually so this is another way that parts can be understood is um in the archetypes and that that particular journey was one where I'd, I'd found a like a large was a large benign cyst in my abdomen and um over a few years, I would kind of go into it and, you know, maybe put my hand on it and ask it to tell me what it had to say. And I really got this sense that that was where my no lived because it wasn't safe for my no to be out and about and on display when I was a child. And so it tucked itself away somewhere for safekeeping so it could come out at a point when it was safe to do so. And, um, and so on one, like fairly early into my parts work, work, past work journey I um I had this process where I journeyed down into my into my body into my abdomen down into my womb actually and there 
I met my wild woman and she was standing in this old, uh, uh, like a Neolithic earth house with big tree trunks holding up the ceiling. And from the outside, it looks like a hobbit house. It's the most amazing building. Um, and so there she was dressed in furs and she handed me back my sacred no. And, um, and from that moment on, I went on this like transformational journey really of learning how to identify other people's boundaries and how to set my own because it's two sides of the same coin mm. like we can't when we don't do boundaries and we can't see boundaries we can't hear boundaries we just don't recognize them we're not respecting other people's boundaries as well as not respecting our own so i learned about both and I think in a way that's been like the most important aspect of my healing journey has been learning how to say no, really. Um, so, yeah, that 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 was an, a, re a really amazing moment. Um, and uh, like, I'm just going to give you like a few a few highlights of the stuff that happened that I just mm. just did not expect. Um. So there was another another process that that I've been on where with a particular friend of mine, we'd got into this dance of anxious and avoidant attachment. So anxious attachment is, please love me. Please, I need to connect. Please, I need to resolve what's going on. There's a difficulty here. Do you still love me? And avoidant is, I want nothing to do with you. Get off. Oh, I feel trapped. Oh, leave me alone. Um. And so when we were both in a sort of secure place, we, we had this lovely relationship. But when one of us would get triggered into our insecure attachment styles, we'd get into this dance that became really painful and just push us further and further apart. And I went, I had this process where eventually I just thought enough, like I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not playing this game. I've had enough of this. And what came up was a sense of having like trigger warning, because this is a little bit gory, but I had this sense of having these meat hooks embedded in my chest. And I, one by one, I kind of pulled them out along with you know, various strange sounds, and visuals, yeah. and all sorts, and pulled them out, all of them. And then uh, wrote down on a piece of paper what they symbolized and burnt that and then washed the ashes away. Did this whole little ritual around it. And now that that's done now, you know, now now that relationship with that friend has just changed. You know, it's, ju it's just transformed that little dynamic that we had going on. Touch wood, fingers crossed, has shifted. Yeah. Um. So. So I started to think that I was doing really some rather good work. <laughs> and maybe it was time that I should start sharing this with the world, which is what I would dearly love to do. Um, and I think I underestimated how brutal the world could be because I, I started just in a tiny little way trying to put myself out on, uh, on um, in some Facebook groups, actually. Mm. And the kind of thing happens that happens in Facebook groups. You're not everybody loves you. You're not everyone's cup of tea. Like that's just how it is. And uh, and it really triggered something in me. So I kind of pulled back and went, "Oh no, I, I I'm not ready for that. I don't know what's going on here, but it's uh, not that yet." Um, and um, I tried doing the things that I would normally do with it. I mean, first of all, um when anything comes up, it's an opportunity. It, there's yeah. always an opportunity for growth. And so the first question I ask myself is, where is the gold here? You know, where, where, where is the, um, you know, where is the lily going to grow from? It's, no, the lotus, isn't it? It's the lotus, lotus that grows from the mud and the sludge at the bottom of the, the pond. So, you know, what, how is it going to grow here? Um, and I took it to therapy like I normally would. I tried a few different therapeutic approaches, which in the past have been immensely helpful. And it just wasn't budging, like it just wasn't shifting. And usually when that happens, it kind of signifies that there's something deeper that wow. we just haven't quite figured out what the root of it is. And when we can get to the root, then all of that other stuff that's layered on top will just sort of naturally 
arrange itself better. Um, I remember one person likening it once to it's like putting like building a tower of Jenga, but putting like a penny underneath it. And so the rest of the tower is just like slightly wonky. And it doesn't matter what you do with all those bricks. It's, it's going to remain gonna wonky. Down. It's going and it's going to come down. Yeah. So you have to figure out where the bloody penny is. Um, so, so I decided to do something really simple and I find that this is often the, the most effective thing to do, to just bring it back to the kind of real simplicity. So I decided that every day I was just going to check in with my parts and just say hello. And, and that was in, that was all. I was just going to say hi. And um, I found myself coming up against this same part that was, um, was kind of living in my chest. There's real tension about it. It spoke, it had a voice like this. It was a guy. And it would stand there with, against this wall, just being like, no, can't talk. I've got to hold this wall up. I've got time. It's got to do serious work. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm not interested in your silly parts where I don't care yeah. who you are with me or what, what you want to know. I'm like, I've got a job. And the most ridiculous thing was like, this wall was about five foot high and five foot wide. Like anything could have got over or around that wall. It was <laughs> but no, that was the most important thing that part could possibly be doing. I've got to hold this wall up. And um, one day, after checking in and checking in and not very much happening, all of a sudden, the wall just came down. And um, and yeah, just another, another trigger warning around this, because again, it was brutal. And I think what that wall had been about was, I don't want to let the world in and I don't want to let myself out because they'll see me and then I'll be attacked and bad, bad will happen. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and I just, but I just let it happen on this occasion. And it turned out that on the other side of the wall, there was this angry pitchfork wielding mob. And on this side of the wall, there was this um, kind of innocent young maiden with long blonde hair and a white dress. And the mob um, just let rip all the hatred, all the fury, all the rage, murderous rage. And they they murdered her in, a, in several horrific ways, the end result of which was her charred remains on tied to the stake in which they'd burnt her as a witch. And um, this kind of left me and this other younger part of me who was like... Um, I couldn't see her face. I could see the mm. outline of a tutu and it was sort of glowing white. It was a silhouette, but it was a white silhouette. And she was sort of fretting about going, oh, what shall we do? She's up there. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so we took these charred remains down off the, um, off the stake of what had become the funeral pyre. Mm. And we took them to the river that was next, next to us. And we washed these the remains until they became bones and then we washed the bones until they regained their flesh and their form and then we pulled this part out of the river and um she was still like stiff as a board and sort of made of wood maybe or tied you know or attached to a board or something mm. like that and um I then went through this process of just really connecting with, with what had happened to her. And oh my goodness, of course she was scared to be seen. Of course she held this huge amount of shame. Of course she was scared of being declared unworthy of being a member of the human race and being exited from it in the most brutal way possible. Like, no wonder I was terrified of being seen. Yeah. You know, if, if I was carrying this level of brutality, and like, and no wonder my reaction was so completely out of proportion with with what was actually happening. Yeah. And um, and uh, we got to a point where I, you know, I'd seen that I could I'd done as much as I could with her, and I spent a bit of time with the the child part as well, and connected with her. And then I realised, oh, the angry mob is a part too. So I turned around to face them and they'd converted from like being this angry pitchfork wielding furious terrifying people they'd now become like characters from a um 
uh, oh my god, what the, you know the Monty Python film that oh uh, um, yes. <laughs> so then, so they become like characters from this lot. She turned me into a witch, but I got better. <laughs> that kind of thing. But they were sort of crossed with Indian runner ducks, so they're all kind of waddling around in different <laughs> directions, not really knowing <laughs> what they were doing. So they were just completely innocuous by that point. Like they were no longer a threat to me. Um and uh but I got to a bit of a sticking point and I couldn't get any further. And so I went and a lot of this process took place actually in a place where currently there is like a multi-story car park and it's like at the back of a shopping center and stuff. But a few hundred years ago, there was actually a ducking stool very close, very nearby. And it's it's not impossible that those kinds of things would have happened, yeah. you know, which is would have been burnt and such like in that place. So I went back a couple of weeks later to where the ducking stool with that, you know, a replica ducking stool has been built on ducking stool lane. Um and I wanted, I just felt like I hadn't reclaimed these parts. They kind of, I, to some extent, I'd helped them to let go of the fear and the shame. But still, we weren't integrated. You know, we yeah. were, there were still all these separate parts. And so I still didn't quite know what was going on. So um, I plucked three leaves off a bush thinking that I will unburden each of these parts there's three parts so I'll do three leads and I started connecting with them <clears throat> the part that I call my maiden now the one that was murdered and um and I kind of got got back in contact with her and she was kind of going right so um I'm done now then so bye and I'd be <laughs> like no I don't I don't think that's how it's supposed to work like I think you come with assets with gifts no right and then all of a sudden, I just had this experience of um, of just oneness, uh, this awareness that this part was not a part, that she was one with everything. She was one with the stream in front of me, with the water and with the fish that were swimming in the water and with the, um, the verdant greenery that was on the other bank and the air around us and, and everything. She was one with all of that. And I realized, oh, this this is the gift that she brings. She connects me with, with all of everything. And, um, and, and it was a familiar way of being, you know, it was, it, I remember it, that feeling from childhood. It was very present for me in childhood, that sense of connection with all things. Um, and from other adventures as well, where one can induce that kind of experience. <laughs> but, um, but no, I don't know, I didn't take anything at this point. All of this kind of quite psychedelic adventure was mm. happening purely like in my own internal world, not not because I, you know, no mushroom chocolate had been eaten or no teas of any kind or anything like that. And um, so, yeah, I invited her. I asked her if she'd like to come and join me and join what I call my love team. So my love team is like, uh, and I support, you know other people to try and create these for themselves as well it's like a a team of beings both human and non-human they can be angelic beings from the spiritual realm and whatever they can be spirit animals they they can be anything um but that supports and guides us and so i invited her to join that and, and she willingly did and i realized that you know she's my she's my spirit guide she's she is the one who can bring me back over and over again to just that sense of just of interbeing, of interconnection with all living things, which is what we've been so so brutally separated from mm -hmm. in this society. You know, it I see that as like our our root trauma in many ways is this this way of life <clears throat> that divorces us from from or life. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and it's and it's unsustainable and it has to change and uh, i don't know how how we do how we go about doing that but um but somehow i feel like she's she's going to help me <laughs> in finding that way through yeah. um and so i don't know if that was a like a metaphorical memory 
or if it was a legacy burden, whether it was something that I just picked up from the culture, from the collective, this fear that women hold of stepping up and being mm. seen and bringing something that is perhaps not the mainstream, that is not conventional, it, that is woo. And, um, and, and, and wanting to offer this delicate, precious gift to, to society, to, to life, because that that can that can be the only thing that can take us out of this like evolutionary dead end that we have otherwise found ourselves in, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> yes. And so you know, so was it was it a collective burden? Maybe. What was it a past life? Possibly. You know, it it it. I think that's the thing that feels like it has the most resonance for me. That maybe it was mm. a past life. Or um, or is she is she just a spirit guide? Was that was that even my stuff, or was that always her stuff? But she was, you know, she needed to be unburdened of it to become a spirit guide for me. So it doesn't really matter, you know, no. which of those it was. You know, I know how deeply healing it is and and was for me, and and that's the most significant thing. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I've got, I could go on and, and talk about how, how other people can, can access this work and, and, and what it involves. Well, but do you have any questions before I do sort of move on? Um, no, no, be, no, it, it's, it's just, it's just so, so fascinating, um, uh, you know, listening to your ex experience your you know your journey um on on this um and the fact that yes a lot of you know a lot of people think that you have to go and have um take loads of stuff to have these trips mm. to work out who you are what you are where you're going but you don't literally you can do it yourself or have someone guide you to do it without taking anything mm -hmm. whatsoever and the and from from the experience that I've had with clients and I'm guessing you've had yourself and with the with people you've been working with is that it's actually much more personal and deeper than if you were taking something something externally to help you with that if that makes sense yeah I mean I I don't have a great deal of experience using plant medicine in a um in a healing context with, mm. the, with the intention of healing. Um, the small amount of experience I do have is that it is really like my system and that kind of work really don't agree. My, mm. my system is too sensitive for that. You know, it completely pushes me over the edge. I don't need it. And, and I find that so many other people don't either. They have these in, immensely rich inner worlds that we just have to sit down and get quiet and get to know. And the more that we get to know it, the more that gets revealed. And it's wild. <laughs> the, yeah. Like the journeys it can take you on are just wild. So, um, and, and without any of those risks that are associated with plant medicine, you know, the, yeah. yeah, there's not a risk of going too far too soon and, and being overwhelmed because it's very carefully held yeah and it is a case of you know we you know as children we have wild imaginations mm. and it's actually okay going back to that 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 child that child thinking of what adventure can i have today what experience can i create mm. today well, what experience can be revealed yeah you know, because it's very much about just stepping back it's learning to step back i think it was well, I know it was Rumi, but I'm not sure I'm going to quote it right. But um, I'm going to get this. I'm going to completely miss. Sorry, Rumi. I'm going to get this quote wrong. But essentially, the work is not to learn to love yourself. It's to seek and to find within yourself all the barriers you have built to love. And that's that's what this work is about. It's, it's seeking and finding within ourselves 
all of these parts all, that carry this unnecessary suffering from the past that they don't need to carry anymore and supporting them to put that down so that we can reveal and, and just uncover within ourselves that, that light that, that continues to shine. And no matter what has happened in your life, no matter what you've been through, somewhere inside there is that unblemished and unbound original source of oneness. And um, so the work is just to just, just gently nudge all the other things, so to love them into wholeness and to love them out of the way so that that can shine, shine forth. Yeah. So, so what are, you know, just a couple of um, things that, that people can do, you know, them, themselves um, to start them on that journey? Well, um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the beauty of this journey is all, all those uh, well, quite a few of those processes that I just described to you were not processes that were held by someone else. They were ones that were I held myself. And I got to that point through a lot of learning and a lot of practice. So um, finding somebody who is skilled in, in the work of somatic parts work is, is key to start with because when, when there's trauma involved, to, to work with that effectively requires like, I have this phrase, like it's like being a virtuoso of beingness. Mm. You had, it's such nuanced and delicate work to be able to like, to balance it just right and just nudge it in the right direction to touch into something then to pull back so that it doesn't overwhelm, but you get enough information to work with. And all of this, um, it does require support and that doesn't mean that you can't learn to to do that for yourself um so the first step actually is is as with trauma as with any kind of trauma therapy it's about stabilizing all those crazy emotions and getting that lunatic out of the driving seat and, and learning how to drive your own body and your own emotions and your own system um so what, there's a lot of learning about what trauma is and, and, and why it impacts us in the way it does um, and learning about how we then fragment in the face of trauma. And we have these wounded parts and all these other parts that try and protect. Um, and then there's a process of needing to be held along, along your journey as you dive deep. And we need, we need trusted people who can, who can hold us in that. And we need community. We need other people who can understand. Um, and then comes that process of okay, yeah, I think I've I think I've got something here. I'm gonna take my new self out into the world, because this work isn't just about like navel gazing. This isn't just about oh, I can have this amazing psychedelic experience inside my body. No, it's about I can shift and transform these things inside myself, and then I can go out into the world. I can I can be a beacon of change in the world. Um, I can change how I am. I can change how I behave. I can clean my side of the street. Um, and that's the that's the hard bit, right? <laughs> like in yeah. many ways, that's the hardest bit. And people don't talk about this. People don't talk about how difficult that is then to take this fragile, vulnerable, new kind of this little bird just learning to fly out into the world and hope that it'll be okay. And um and there's a whole other then process around that of, of supporting that and, and enabling that to, you know, enabling that bird to soar so that yeah. eventually you can fly free. Um, so, yeah, this, this work is for the courageous. You know, this, this work is for those who are ready for their, their heroines or heroes journeys. Um, and, um, like if you if you think this kind of work might be for you and you're like oh no I'm not but oh it sounds like a bit too much and oh, I can guarantee that you're already in pain I can guarantee that you're already living with and and spending huge amounts of your your life source trying to manage the pain and the fragmentation of trauma already like simply living in this culture is traumatic and so either you can sit with that pain with no hope of change. Or you can dive into that pain and come out the other side transformed. 
and I know which one I'd rather do. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. And and um, did you, so, uh, and this is really a vertical question because you're actually on my show now. Um, <laughs> so when you went and uh, what happened to all those, and this, yeah, what happened to the little girl and uh, all that mob that, that turned into those crazy characters? Do you know, that's a really good question. <laughs> so I'm still working. So the little girl, um, I'm still working with her. She's a real core part of mine. She carries um, she carries our original threat response. So the parts tend to fragment according to which threat response type they carry. So they might be fight, flight, freeze, or the more kind of the less well-known ones, a flop, what I call flop, fawn, and flail. <laughs> So flail is, it's, it's proper official name is attach, cry for help. But it does feel, when you're in it, it feels like you're just flailing around, just hoping somebody, somebody help me, someone save me. And, it, and there's good reason for that, because it's our original threat response. We are born and we cry. And uh, we cry in order to attract the attention of our caregiver, of our mother, so that they will be able to identify what unmet need we have and meet it for us. So that comes before the need to eat, the need for shelter, the need for warmth and protection and all of those things. The need for love and connection is absolutely fundamental. And so when attach cry for help is, is traumatized, that experience of desperation and oh my god I need you I need this person they will come and they will fix everything inside me and then I'll be okay which tends to be pathologized in our culture as like love addiction or borderline personality disorder um or a whole variety of you know other things um it's just this part doing what is so natural for it but but what is actually just does not fit at this stage in life so yeah, so there's a deeper, longer piece of work that I'm doing with with that particular part to really ensure that it feels safe, that it knows that its home is here, that it knows that I am always here, and um, and that will be ongoing throughout my life. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even the most um, you know, unless, unless you're sort of like. Um, I don't know the Dalai Lama or something. You you kind of like you. There's always going to be you know any spiritual person, any um, person you know on a higher dimension or whatever. There's always going to be something you're always going to be working on because there's always going to be something that's going to come in. Yeah, it's it's just it's just one. And what about that mob? That the mob. Said. Do you know what? I think that was a bit of an oversight on my part. Perhaps I need to go back and check in with the mob because they haven't come back since. They haven't kind of said, oh, yes, I am here and I'm ready. Because I, I tend to say to my parts, you know, that thank you for showing me everything that you've shown me and thank you for, for everything that you've done to try and keep me safe. And I will make time to come back and connect with you. And if you need me, then let me know. And that particular part has not has not come back. Cool. They obviously so enjoy they the Monty Python needed. characters. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's what they needed, some fun in their life. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, they were all right after that, waddling around. Yeah. <laughs> I got this. You you paint, you, you speak so eloquently and paint such vivid pictures. It's, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Being a storyteller myself, I love listening to... Mm. Uh, when other people can can tell a story um uh you know and actually bring that story to to life so that people actually understand how real it is mm. um for it so thank you so so much for that so as you know i do guide meditations angel oracle card readings and each week i like to ask my guests whether they would like me to do a mini guide meditation or put an angel oracle card for themselves and those watching so, Mariel, what would you like me to do? I would love an oracle card, please. Funny enough, I've got them in my hand. Yeah. This <laughs> He's one you prepared earlier. Uh, most people like having the cards done. Yeah. So, and and I and I love doing and I love doing the cards mm. um, anyway. So, as always, when I do the cards, I do the cards for what you need to know uh, for your present in the here and now. Because mm -hmm. although I work with the past, when I take people back into the past, it's to heal, to learn, to experience, so it doesn't affect them in the present. 
I want to mm -hmm. take people into the future. It's so they can understand, see, know where they're going, what they need to do to bring that back to the present. So they're not worrying about it, but they can live in the present and take those steps. So what does Muriel and everyone who's watching this live or the replay need to know for their highest good at this moment in time? Okay, so what card wants to come out today? Perfect, especially with what we've been talking about, impasse, Redir reflect and redirect your energy. Mm -hmm. How much more perfect is that for what you're actually talking about and what you're doing in confirmation? Mm -hmm. um you know that that what you're doing is absolutely perfect and spot on um uh for it which i think is absolutely uh which is absolutely brilliant for you because it's that that confirmation um with with the work with your work you're doing um you know and for anyone who's watching this you know it is you know it is go within reflect you know and if need be redirect your energy you know, redirect your energy over the wall. You know, re oh, there's redirect. even a wall. Yeah. Wall. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or redirect your energy at picking up the nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that. So it's, it's it's so it's knowing that an impasse is only there to make you stop and think, to understand, to learn, so that you can then move on forward. So uh, yeah, so that was an absolutely brilliant card, and really ties in with what with what you're doing, Mary, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So, do you have any insights or thoughts or last words of wisdom to leave our viewers? Oh goodness, all the things I was going to say, I already said. <laughs> so, I think fundamentally, it's just to know that that anyone can do this work. This is not something particularly special about me. Um, this is within everybody. We all have this capacity. And, and we, when we can all just take the time to quietly look inside and see what is there and to love all those parts of us into wholeness, that's a place from which we can create the, the new world which we so desperately need at the moment like there has never been a more important time for for doing this work beautiful yeah absolutely wise wise words there so i hope everyone that you've enjoyed this conversation found it insightful because i know i definitely have and i've learned a lot of things i didn't know today so if people want to connect with you mariel how do they do that what's the best way of them finding about you and the work you do yes well i have an exciting announcement coming up we're not quite Ooh. ready for it yet, but uh, um, I, I don't have any capacity for one-to-one -one work at the moment, but I do have some exciting alternative offers that will be seeing the light of day soon. So if you want to know about those, then please do find me on Facebook, follow my, follow my page, follow me on Instagram and Facebook and, you know, those, those places. Um, I think the um my handles will be in the yeah the below below for the comments down yeah. there. um so yeah join up and keep your eyes peeled there will be news oh exciting <laughs> stuff we, we, it's very exciting we we like we look forward to uh to that so thank you so much Muriel, for sharing your wisdom it's been an absolute um pleasure and of course, anyone who's watching, if you are now ready to remember your divine presence and step onto your spiritual multidimensional path, but you feel lost, confused, stuck or alone, then please feel free to connect with me and we can see where you are now and how you can move forward to take charge of your destiny so that you can spread your wings and soar. And of course, you can receive a free future life progression recording to discover your destiny by singing to your future to get guidance and clarity that you can use in your current life. Um, as well as a couple of other free gifts by signing up to my email list. And you can also find more about Angel Wings membership, which will help you come out of the spiritual closet and enjoy creating life on your terms by visiting my website, Radiant Angel Energy. 
So again, thank you everyone so much for watching. And I'd like to invite you to share this video as I'm sure there are people who feel lost want to clear, get clear on their destiny just like you and may have trauma that they need to heal from. Um, you know, and the, the words of wisdom that Meryl has given today can actually help, you know, can actually help them. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please feel free to subscribe and hit that bell button to be notified when the show goes live or I post new guided meditations. It's every subscribe, like, comment, not just on YouTube, but on Facebook, Instagram, whether it's mine or Meryl's um, sites, really do help with the algorithms and actually help get our messages out there so that we can be of service to more people. And you can do your part by helping this be that service to people. And of course, I look forward to you all joining me same time, same place next week. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.